Well, welcome everybody to another episode of the Future of Biz Tech. I am your host, JC Granger. I have with me here, Brittany Greenfield, the founder and CEO of Wabi. Brittany, thank you so much for coming on the show. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do? Well, thanks so much for having me, uh, JC. Um, so I'm Brittany Greenfield. I'm CEO and founder of Wabi. And what we do is help enterprise DevOps teams scale application security as part of their existing development infrastructure. You know, application security has been one of these important things, but hard problems to tackle for a lot of enterprises for a long time. I think a lot of people recognize Equifax still as the seminal breach. I think mm -hmm. many of us are probably still waiting for our checks. <laughs> to oh, come yeah, but that that right. whole set, I forgot about that. That's right. <laughs> right. And, you know, that was a breach that was due to process breakdown. Um, and, you know, it cost them $700 million. What company wants to do that? Um, they've, they've really come out on the other side of it and been a great leader in how to deploy application security in modern development pipelines. And we're trying to help the rest of the enterprise ecosystem as well as the DOD uh, tackle that challenge as well. That's really cool. You know, and I've had a couple guests on the show that live in that security space. And I always kind of ask kind of the same thing, which is, you know, is there anything that's unhackable? Is there anything that's foolproof? And if not, you know, how close do you get and how do you give that kind of peace of mind to customers or the government if you're working with them? You know, so I think that's that's the first piece of advice I actually give. Um, and I think, especially when it comes to application security, there's no such thing as perfect code. And therefore, there can be no such thing as perfect application security. And if as individuals, as enterprises, we can get out of that idea of perfect security, that we can build taller walls to protect us, we can then just take practical steps to move forward, right? One of the ones that's the simplest we can do, don't use the default uh, Wi-Fi name and password on your home <laughs> system, right? Yeah. We've seen a number of DDoS attacks go down, not just because of your home Wi-Fi systems, but your printers, your baby cams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if we stop thinking that we can just rely on tools, then we'll start adopting those practices. And I think that's one of the things that makes application security is especially special in the security realm um, is, is that it's more about the process and then we can support with tools. And that's something you certainly know this, um, you know, we always start in technology, not with the tools, but with people process and then support mm -hmm. with tools. And, and that's really um, when you think about security, if you take that approach, whether as an individual and enterprise, mm -hmm. how you can deploy a successful program. So what types of companies, like what industries do you find are, you know, reaching out to you guys, you know, I mean, you said government, you work with them, maybe is it local, you know, municipality kind of style, is it state, federal, and then on the company, yeah. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so for us, really, it's, it, you have to hit two parameters. One, you have to see software as a competitive advantage, um, right? You need to ship software faster to give yourself a, a head start, um, whether it's against your competitors, against your adversaries. Um, and so you're, it, you've adopted rapid development methodologies. And the second, that's really a sweet spot, and I think why um, federal, especially the DOD, has been great for us, um, are those enterprises that have chosen to undergo DevOps um, transformations. You know, we're in the world of in the last decade, most organizations were born DevOps native, or at least a flavor of it. Um, but when an organization has chosen to undergo DevOps transformation, they get that it's not just about shipping software faster, but about eliminating bottlenecks so you have if more efficiency. Um, I dig on Facebook a lot. They sort of popularize that move back, move fast and break things mantra. Mm -hmm. And that's one piece of it. But really what DevOps and Agile is about is move efficiently and fix things at the right time. Yeah. And, um, and so that's why we tend to see the larger mid-market and commercial up to the Fortune 500. And then most recently, I'm starting to work with the DOD. So let's talk more about, uh, instead of government, I, mean, I like touching on it because it's good for people to know that there are companies out there that are trying to help protect, you know, the government stuff and whatnot, but let's talk more about the enterprise. So, I, and I don't know if you have like NDAs with your clients, if you want to mention a client name, you, it'll be great. If not, can you tell us, you know, what, you know, give us an example, maybe a brand name uh, uh, company out there that would have use for your services, just so people can kind of frame who your services are, are really tailored to. Yeah, so it goes everything from, you know, the large banks in the world, like the JP Morgans, um, to the fintech providers, whether um, like 
Diebold Nixdorf, which may not be a household name, um, but um, but is a major, if you ever go into a bank, you're using a Diebold Nixdorf yeah. solution. <laughs> um, down to, um, you know, one of my former employers, Kronos, um, you know, who helped support a majority of our, sorry, they're UKG now, now post acquisition, um, supports the majority of the hourly workforce across the world from TSA to Kroger. And, you know, they all care about it because it fits that I have information that's sensitive. Who doesn't nowadays? Mm -hmm. I care about delivering software to market um, as a competitive advantage. And I understand it's not enough to just ship fast. I have to ship right. Um, but nothing's ever going to be perfect. And that's sort of where we get into, you know, it's hard to say just the brand names. Obviously, you know, everybody like AWS and Microsoft and Google yeah. will have a need for us too. Um, but I think it's really all of those organizations that enable our digital economy that mm -hmm. um, that are our sweet spot. So if you're walking it, whether you're walking into a bank or a grocery store or a, um, or, um, you know, getting a Netflix movie, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> oh, uh, that those are the folks that know that that security is part of the infrastructure, not just this sort of backdoor mm -hmm. black hat, white hat, yeah. cool hoodie, hey, trying to triage it. <laughs> So, you know, you, you use the word ship and software at the same time a lot. And I feel like that might be an older term that just carried over. Explain what that really means. Because, you know, people think software, so it's a digital thing. Or, or do you actually literally ship a hardware piece that can integrate? Like, like what does that mean to someone hearing shipping software? It sounds like a counterintuitive yes. term. <laughs> Sorry, you know, buzzword bingo across all right. <laughs> It's shipping software is really just saying it's no different than any kind of deliverable, it, which is... Uh, it, I am now done with this. It is now ready to go out, uh, whether it's ready to go out to some customers for, for early testing or it's ready to go out to the broader market. You know, we use the term shipping software um, because it does come from that traditional concept of, well, I now have my item. It's time to ship it to the customer. But yeah. yeah. Exactly that. Okay. I, was, I, I just want to make sure because I, I mean, like, I, I get it, but I know a lot of people listening might be like, wait a minute. Is she... Is she sending it on a CD? Because <laughs> like, right. so, you used to get, remember software used to literally ship. Oh, wait, you wait, literally wait. used to ship like AOL. I, I, that, that was literally shipping software when I had the AOL CDs show up. <laughs> well, here's what, where you'll get a real kick out of this. I often like to explain, and, and maybe it's, it's good to hit on this for your audience now, the, the change in software development over the last about 15 years from what was called Waterfall to Agile and DevOps. And, um, and I use, do you remember Encarta, right? Yeah. Like Encarta, yeah. once a year, you got an update to the encyclopedia yeah. of what's yeah. true in the world, right? Yeah. Net Netscape for the right. browser. Netscape. Yeah. Hey, AOL, you would get yep. your CD. Hey, and now we're in the world of Wikipedia where there are updates all the time. Real and time. That's yeah. The difference in software development. You used to have a year to make sure that your software, your Encarta, met the quality standards, the security standards, or you know, whatever it was that you needed before you shipped it. Now that's happening in two week cycles. You know, practically we sort of have a merging of it. You know, people do two week cycles, but really do releases, you know, every month, every quarter. Mm -hmm. And, but, and right, just like Wikipedia, you can go on there at any time and make a change and somebody can update it and it gets approved. Um, I use that example with some of our engineers who are more freshly out of college and I had to explain to them what Encarta was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now so, sign, sign me up for this. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, uh, what motivated you to start your company? I mean, you know, what's your previous, you, you mentioned Kronos, like what, where do you come from in the professional world? And what was that defining moment where you're like, I got to do this on my own. I've got to, I'm going to go start a company. You know, where did that motivation come from? Yeah. So, so Kronos, right. Definitely not cybersecurity. Um, it's in workforce management. So I actually am admittedly a cybersecurity outsider. And I think it's something that has really helped me in identifying what the problem and the solution is. I started my career in the ERP space in technical roles, but really moved into go-to-market strategy roles. So Go find a problem. What's the solution? Go build the mm -hmm. team and execute on it. Sounds a lot like building a startup. 
And I moved into cybersecurity while I was at Sloan. I worked for Cisco. They just m missed the cloud transition and the head of cloud and managed services said, hey, we need somebody to work on the next big thing, which is IoT. Um, and I use that as a great example at the beginning. IoT is very hard to secure. And it's because even if you have two Nest cameras that are the same for model, um, they may have been produced at different times on the, on the line. And so they may have slightly different software. So I really started digging into it. And as I mentioned, before realize that security is just a piece of our foundation of our digital infrastructure today, right? Our economy, we don't even need to put digital in front of it. And so I got into the ERP space. I wanted to go back to startups. Um, and sorry, ERP is endpoint, uh, or EDR, endpoint. And um, I realized I was looking for where we needed to move in the market and said, okay, there's a lot of focus on building walls, very much to your first question. How can we just make ourselves more secure, right? Building walls and modes and detection and response systems. But that's kind of like installing an ADT system and not checking to see if your front door locks or it's being shut, or do you have the right kind of lock on? And that's where application security comes in. And it was sort of the redheaded stepchild. Security didn't want it, <laughs> development didn't want it. And I said, why is this a problem? So I started exploring the idea. I said, we, we, we sort of have these waterfall, old style security practices trying to be deployed in modern, agile, fast development practices. How can we bring them together? And then the Equifax breach happened. And that was my yeah. light bulb moment because it's not good enough to just have a good idea. You have to have a good idea at the right time. And I went, there's something to be done here. Did some early research and um, and that's where Wabi was born, really. Well, that, that's, uh, that's a, it, you're right. The timing is everything. And I mean, what better time than when it's fresh on people's minds? I mean, that was a shock through not just the consumer system, but massively through the, the professional and corporate system too, because they handled it for everyone everyone and everything right, right. everyone and everything and, and all the roads led back to them so you hack them you get a spider web out into access which was which was crazy so um now let, now let's talk about this here um you know you you, you founded uh wabi after the equifax breach um which, which is a great reason to and I, I wish probably more hopefully more did as well because i think that's something that people realized needed to be done so i'm glad that you did you know, 95% though of the, of the tech world and founders are, are male. What has it been like for you as a female founder specifically? And, and for the record, I, I don't ask this because I think anything different than genders. In fact, I wish there were more females. My, my daughter's 15 right now. She's big into tech stuff, you know, and I like asking, you know, what's that been like? What's been the hard parts? What have been the, the good parts, right? So just what has that path been like when you said, I'm going to go in the tech world as a female founder and try to go and, and, and play in a, in, a, in a space where it's so male dominated. And, and so, and we bridge two industries that happen to really suffer from the representation problem with women accounting for less than a quarter of the work those force both in DevOps and security. Um, and, you know, when I first went into it, I went, oh, they say it's so hard to be a female founder. Not, not for me, right? I'll, I'll be totally, totally um, honest with you about that. And the reality is, and I'm not the first person to say, say this, is that there's just a lot of implicit biases. There, there is a difference between men and women. I'm not going to say that there isn't. We do things differently. Hey, and there's a difference between all people, right? We all have different approaches. And some of the models out there have been um, constructed around a more traditional approach, which has just had more men that founded companies. And so their model, VC models, or what people are used to seeing at pitch days or whatnot, is just a slightly mm -hmm. different style. And so as we started coming out, I mean, I'll, I'll give you crazy examples. I presented my business plan model, which was a 10 page Excel spreadsheet to VC. And I was like, so any questions? They're like, we're not used to people actually having logic behind their numbers. They typically just come up with a number with like five data points. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can talk about that on a whole separate. I, I, wish, I wish I could just do that. That'd be great. Like, oh yeah. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a billionaire now. Look at these five data points. <laughs> we, we've certainly seen that. I'm pretty sure there's a brand new documentary about it too. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, little things like that, or even some of my presentation style, some of the feedback that came back to me, and I said, I'm just going to still be me, right? Like, mm -hmm. hey, you say that you want to do this. I have a very narrative storytelling presentation style, and I'm going to stick with me. If you don't want to invest in me, then that's great because you're not the right person to be on my team. Because really, you have to see investors as being an extension of your team, especially early yeah. 
stage. It's also one of the reasons we decided to bootstrap for a while. Um, I went through a process, even though I'm a technical person, I said, I learned early in my career, I should not be the one writing code. So I went down to good old fashioned wireframes, interactive wireframes, Excel spreadsheets to go test our idea. So we actually had six months of being in business without a product. And it was a great thing that we didn't do that because the initial roadmap we had was wrong. Um, so I think I've just, you know, I think the biggest thing is I've taken a different approach and there are certainly times that that's been challenging. 2020 was certainly one of the years um, when it came to fundraising. It was for us, we were going to say it was going to be sort of our um, debutante year. And like, like a lot of other female founders, we saw fundraising drop um, drastically while everybody else um, had a massive increase in it. Flip side is, you know, who's really got your back, um, who's going to be there in the tough times as a founder, you want to know that those people are there for you. Um, it was a real, it was a real lesson in saying, um, who believes in me? Um, mm -hmm. Who can I call when I have a problem? And, um, and I think that's what you want as a founder, right? I think we think founders are just magical beings, right? You know, we annoy them with the term unicorn at some point in time, hopefully. Um, I'm not gonna lie, it would be great. <laughs> um, but they're not, we're just regular people and we all need help. And I think that's sort of been the biggest difference for me and my approach to it, which I get criticism for sometimes and I'm gonna still be me. And I think that's the only thing I can give advice to all founders, um, not just women, but that's the, that's probably the challenges you're gonna feel a little so let's, talk about, so let's talk about bootstrapping. Obviously, your goal in 2021 is, is to go after, you know, a round of funding. Um, in the meantime, how are, and I'm a marketing guy, right? I've, I've been doing digital for like 20 years and, you know, my agency, we do B2B SaaS marketing. So I'm always going to ask a B2B SaaS person you know, or software person, whether it be a software as a service or software in general. Yep. What are you doing to get the, other than this, I mean, you're on a podcast, so that, that's good. That's well, step okay. one, right? That, that, that's one. But what types of digital marketing are you guys doing to get yourself out there in front of these other companies so that you can get more clients so that you look more attractive to investors? Like just what kind of tips can you give or what do you guys it's a chicken and an egg thing. And I got, I, I wish we'd been doing more of this early on, forget, you know, 2020 was a year. You know, I got a great tip from another founder because I'd been worried about talking about the problem before we really had the solution to solve it. And, and we're really an infrastructure platform. So those things don't get built overnight. Um, and he said, no, there's a way to talk about the problem and how you're going to solve it in the future while being authentic without selling snake oil. Um, so that would be my, right. You could still go out and have these honest conversations. We're talking about the business model here, but I can have the same conversation in a year ago before we, we released a general availability about who our customers were. And, you know, even as we were figuring out our customer profile, um, you know, I think you have to figure out what the right channel is. For us, we're in a market that is incredibly noisy. And it was one of the reasons I was, I was nervous early on about doing a lot of digital marketing. Are we just gonna feed into the noise? Um, and so what we've actually done is say, we're going to take a very thought leadership approach. We're going to go out there and of course we're going to do webinars, outreach, you know, all the classic, right. classic uh, channels, but we're going to do a little more of a, a traditional enterprise sale, um, work with analysts, work with thought leaders like yourselves, just to raise awareness about lobby, um, you know, with your community or folks in our industry specifically, and really try to be that calm for our buyers. And that's the approach we're taking, you know, digital marketing such, I think the great thing about 2020, you know, it's hard to find some, but I always try to look for silver linings as we have changed a little bit of our information gathering and buying behaviors. So it's a lot easier to have that conversation. You know, it's called the consultative sale. It's not just that, like, can we help you solve your problem? We don't have to spend three weeks trying to get everybody in a conference room. You know, let me give you a webinar I just did, or let me give you a report we just wrote. And I think that's uh, something that maybe we'll see the pendulum swing back on as well in the enterprise sale. We've seen a lot of enterprises go out and be very transactional, all about the inbound. Um, and I think you have to balance the two. Um, you know, we have to go be out there. That's why digital marketing is so important so yeah. that people know there's a solution. Uh, we were talking to one of our clients recently. He's like, I got to tell you, oh, um, I wish you had been around a year ago. We bought a competitor because there was nothing else on the market. We didn't think it was good. But then we also had to go through a procurement process where we had to show that we evaluated three solutions. And we had to write up 
several pages on the fact that there weren't any other solutions because we didn't know about you. And I'm yeah. like, yep, you're totally right, right? This is why we have to make sure you can find us and then we can have that educated conversation. For sure. Well, uh, so as the title of the, of the podcast, The Future of Biz Tech, I'm gonna go into some future questions here. So I've got two. Uh, the first one is, where do you see the security DevOps you know, uh, community going, just technology-wise, in five or 10 years? Like, where do you see that being the most important? Do you see what kind of advances, maybe with an AI or something like that, with that? And then the second part of the question is, you know, what's coming down the pipeline for Wabi, right? Like, what are those things that my listeners can go, oh, I, I knew about that first before yeah. it came out. So I'm going to break your first question into three pieces. Uh, one, you talk about AI, cybersecurity is, and, and DevOps are great um, testing grounds for AI because they have such data rich feature sets. Um, but however, that tends to be what limits the adoption of it because it's the concept of data versus information. Mm -hmm. Right. If if I give you data, that's like saying it's 30 degrees. Well, is it 30 degrees inside or outside uh, in Boston in March or Boston in June? <laughs> right. I need to have that context because I don't know what to do next as the human and that needs to take that information and turn it into to a next step. That's where AI is really going to help um, almost like robotics. Right. Um, help humans do their jobs better. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think DevOps and, and security are just going to be places where AI flourishes. Um, you know, from a broader DevOps and security um, theme and where the market's going, security has a lot of different solutions, um, right? That's not going to change because there are a bunch, the same way that that everybody on your street probably secures their home a different way. Mm -hmm. Enterprises are always going to do that because their risk profiles and, and risk isn't just security risk, business risk, you know, what they care about. You know, for example, JP Morgan and Netflix might actually care about some of the same things more so than JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley do, yeah. right? You know, because they have, they have different priorities. Um, so how you adopt that risk profile, it means you're going to use a different set of tools and even if you use the same tools you'll use them differently but specifically around application security and devops um, I, I often use the analogy of uh, crm salesforce right mm -hmm. who owns salesforce in an organization is it it or is it sales sales oh, right? yeah yeah i was gonna say yeah sales is gonna do it yeah and um and it's because but, it, but it's a, but salesforce i mean i mean if, if you're talking about the software anyway like that's it's such a heavy software that you have to include it in there uh, exactly. But sales owns the day-to-day -day of it. You, you yeah. have, I will give you your 20 later. You have teed me up perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> but sales owns the day-to-day -day of it, but IT supports them. Yeah. But sales has to take ownership of that because that is a critical system for them in delivering what they do. Mm -hmm. Same thing is happening with, happening with DevOps and application security. Development has to own it. And they've already recognized that there needs to be that shared services model. Mm -hmm. Well, but development needs to be at the at the lead. So you hear a lot about developer-led security, right? We're development-led. We think it's everybody's job, not just to say that, right? And, and that's part of what we do. We make security part of everybody's job in the development team while giving um, the security team the confidence that the, gover that the governance is still being deployed correctly. Um, and so that's the big shift. I don't even think this is a five to 10 year shift that security is going to just become part of DevOps. Application security is gonna become part of DevOps. Um, we talk about that a lot. Um, and, but security is still gonna play an important role. Strategically, how do we manage our, our security profile? They're gonna get out of the day-to-day -day management of all those lists of data and get to be a partner um, rather than a babysitter to development. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's what's coming in the next, I mean, we're certainly betting on it in the next year to two. Um, and we've already seen some of that market traction, the, the shift to remote work accelerated that as mm -hmm. well. You know, on your second question, where we're going, um, you know, I don't think it's, it's, we've talked a bit about it in the press. I don't think it's coincidental that I've probably talked about it a couple of times now, and it's continuing to work with the DOD. Um, for, you know, anybody that's on here, um, the DOD, I think, has taken a great approach to software and software development and commercial technologies. Um, that's now the rest of the federal is, is, um, 
following and you know they've really said we we're no we're not different if we're going to actually use software well <laughs> which maybe not all federal ag agencies are there yet um but if we're going to use software well because everybody else in our economy does uh we need to go tap into the best, best technologies and those are going to be on the commercial side um so i don't think it's a surprise that we actually found early in our journey that it's a great uh match for us mm -hmm. and we may have get to announce some things soon um about who we're working with uh, hopefully knock on wood and um you know but it's been fun right because it's about identifying for any founder any business right this isn't unique to the startup who are the best teams that are dealing with your problem that want to be part of the solution and so that's why you know you start hearing me talk about it a bit at the top and i think that's probably probably around the time of this uh that this podcast release we'll have some new yeah. news on that too <laughs> hopefully hopefully last question for you what is the best piece of advice that you can give the audience based on your personal experience with what you've gone through with your company? Hmm. You know, I, I think, um, gosh, <laughs> you think I'd have a better answer. The problem isn't that I don't have, I don't have one piece of advice. I probably have 15 that you people gotta, have given me. Gun, gun to your head, you got to pick one. Right. You know, um, <laughs> This was given to me specifically in the context of being a founder. Uh, you know, people say being a CEO is the loneliest job and then being a founder CEO is even lonelier. There aren't a lot of people out there that understand the problems you're going through. And early in my journey, um, somebody said, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. And, and I sort of like brushed it off. I thought it was a little like, I actually thought it was a little sexist. And it wasn't until somebody else who's also a mentor said that to me. And I was like, oh, okay, what's this about? Well, fast forward six months, I got it. <laughs> it finally clicked. And being vulnerable isn't, isn't about, you know, oh, let me go cry on somebody's shoulder. And if that's how you do that, that's great. It's about not being afraid to talk about your problems. Understand that whether it's an official work team or your own sort of, I call it my personal board of advisors, they may not actually understand the specific problem or maybe not your industry, but they can always be there. They're part of your, your community for a reason. And the more you can share and have that transparency, 2020 was a great example of why transparency and being willing to be open about things um, is important, right? It was important in our communications with our employees. Hey, we don't know what's happening next month because we couldn't figure out what was happening the last six months. Um, so, you know, bear with us, but we'll keep you up to date. We may change priorities in terms of our functionality and our hiring plans. And when you can do that, then you can, right, you don't actually have to, you still carry the weight and the responsibility, right? At the end of the day, you're the leader of your organization, whatever size it is. Um, but, you know, people can help. Sometimes it's just offering a different perspective. Sometimes it's being a sounding board. Um, and, and that goes, that little bit of help goes a long way. So I'd say for any leader, not just startup leaders, don't be afraid to be vulnerable and talk about your problems because somebody's been there or maybe they know somebody that's been there or maybe they're, they're just there to lend a helping ear. Um, mm -hmm. And all of those things are, are, are um, important. Don't feel you have to be. I, I think that's great advice. I mean, personally, you know, I, I, I do everything the hard way. Ask my parents, right? You know, I mean, and I also, you know, I, I didn't have any mentors or anything like that coming up. So uh, I'm the person who can be a mentor because I suffered as much as physically possible becoming a founder because I had no guidance whatsoever. It was just stepping on landmine after landmine after landmine. But uh, I agree because you know, uh, being able to tell that story personally and 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 leaning on people, even though you feel like you might be all by yourself, I, I think that's a great advice. So I appreciate that for the audience. Um, how can people reach uh, Wabi? How can they reach you personally if they want to uh, uh, do so? So, you know, um, I have an open door policy with our employees, our customers, and please for your audience as well, don't be shy to find me on LinkedIn. Um, the only ask I have is just let me know why you want to connect. <laughs> um, yeah. as, as we all do now, LinkedIn. Yeah. Just, 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 just say, you know, heard you on Future of Biz Tech podcast when you're doing the invite or, or the connection request, right? Okay. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just give me a little context. Yeah. <laughs> And but you know, please don't be shy about reaching out. Whether you're interested in in the problems we're tackling, thinking about founding a company, or just interested in meeting with somebody new, it's actually been another silver lining. It's easier to meet new people this year. You don't have to worry about travel schedules. Yeah. And, and you know, are we in the same town? Um, and little known secret, actually, if you go to Wabi's website and you say "Let's talk" and choose to have a sec DevOps chat, that will be with me. Uh, what's um, the Wabi's website URL? 
Uh, wabisoft.com w-a-b-b-i-s-o-f-t.com perfect and on all social media you can find us at hi wabi um that's our handle across everything so please don't be shy to reach out um you know appreciate you know jc it's been great talking to you i'd love to connect further with your broader community too so don't be shy about coming and finding us awesome thank you so much Brittany, for being on the show and uh i hope to talk to you again soon likewise